Today's episode is proudly brought to you by Anne Hello, my name's Rebecca Tapp and welcome to Decoding Purpose. The word purpose has worked its way into part of our everyday vocabulary, not just in business, but also in our personal lives. So where do we begin with such a big concept? And what are some of the steps we can take to explore our purpose and apply it to our lives? In Decoding Purpose, we unlock the minds of on-purpose activists, innovators, entrepreneurs, scientists, creatives, spiritual thinkers, and everything else in between. Welcome to the podcast, Decoding Purpose. Hello and welcome to the Decoding Purpose podcast. Regular listeners of Decoding Purpose will know that for me, a huge part of my pursuit for purpose has been in exploring what some may refer to as the space in between, that being consciousness or life force. For some, that is a space that is uncovered in in meditation or maybe yoga. For others, this space is the exploration of Eastern philosophies such as the Ikigai or mindfulness or, or even prayer. It is a space that could be found in science, nature, or in the expression of art. Whatever it is for you personally and and for everyone, it is unique. It's a space of solitude, reflection, introspection, and of a deeper connection to the body, mind, and spirit. That is why I'm excited to dive into that space in order to decode our personal dharma with Ayurvedic practitioner, meditation master, and keynote speaker extraordinaire, Mark Bunn. One of the things that I personally admire and respect about Mark is the manner in which he has been able to simplify and translate Eastern medicine so that it makes sense in a modern world. Mark's speaking presentations for corporate organizations really do take the transcendental and make it tool-driven, practical, and highly applicable to a day at work in the Western world. At the heart of the conversation is an Eastern exploration of high performance and purpose or or our Dharma as the superhighway that allows us to step into our higher potential. Mark's background as a professional AFL footballer has provided him with a deep understanding of exercise, nutrition and health science. However, his passion to understand Eastern medicine was inspired by a a volunteer trip to Southeast Asia for an aid organisation where he witnessed people who, despite living in extreme poverty, were so happy. This made him question what was different about their way of life. These people weren't worried about good fats, bad fats, cholesterol levels, or high-tech exercise programs. Their levels of health and happiness were off the charts compared to our sophisticated Western society. So began Mark's research into Eastern medicine. After years of studying the world's healthiest, longest living people and formal training in Ayurvedic medicine, Maharishi Ayurveda, Mark wrote Ancient Wisdom for for Modern Health. The book's popularity in becoming a three-time bestseller confirmed Mark's belief that making health simple is the key for sustained happiness at work, at home, and is a key in our pursuit for purpose. Today, Mark and I covered so much ground talking about transcendental meditation, the basics of Ayurvedic profiling or what is called our doshas, the incredible intuitive abilities of our bodies, and just how much we have to learn from ancient practices about purpose. Welcome to the podcast, Mark Bum. Lovely to be here, Beck. Oh, it's such a pleasure to have you live here in the studio. I always love having conversations about purpose mm. face to face. So yeah. thank you for, for joining us. My absolute pleasure. Now, Mark, I'm going to start with uh, a question that I ask every single guest on the Decoding Purpose podcast, and I'm always fascinated mm. with the variety of answers, and that is whether you, whether you think that purpose is a conscious choice, an intentional decision, or whether it's a little bit more to do with synchronicity and fate. Yes, I believe it's 100% of both, and that is our essential purpose in life is predetermined but it's 100% our choice whether we choose to go down that path and live that purpose or 
get distracted and go on another path. So, um, yeah, it's predetermined, but we obviously have the choice whether we live that. One of the unique capabilities of being a human being as opposed to a uh, any other animal. So uh, choice is a big one. Excellent. The reason I wanted to interview you today was to decode the connection between our health, vitality and our ability to live a purposeful life. Mm. However, before doing that, I wanted to learn a little more about your personal journey of purpose I know uh, in a previous incarnation, you were a professional AFL player, and I'm sure that grounded you in how health science could aid both your performance and your purpose as Mm. an athlete. So what I'm interested in understanding is, firstly, what worked for you from the perspective of Western medicine, and where were the gaps? What propelled you to dive into Eastern medicine? Yeah, it's really interesting, actually, because I was young, 16 or 17. My mother used to give me books on mind-body medicine and Dr. Wayne Dyer and Louise Hay. And and I was, my purpose at that point in my head was to play AFL football. That's all I wanted to do. So I was very single-minded. And when I was 19, um, I learned transcendental meditation. A guy who was teaching a lot of the top athletes and business people taught me that. And then he gave me a book on Ayurvedic medicine, all about sports performance and fitness, which I was studying at the time. So that very Western model of work hard, push hard to get a result was sort of firmly in my mind. And football was exactly that. You know, you had to really sort of focus and very macho. But then when I started to meditate and then started to read into Ayurvedic medicine, it was a complete polar opposite in a sense. And it really broadened my mind to that there's a bigger purpose in life than just kicking a bit of leather around and going out on the weekend and smashing yourself into um, smithereens. So um, I'm sure you kicked that ball with purpose. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that was good to have that background too, to have that Western style. And so when I got into the Eastern approaches and when I finished my football career, I went to Southeast Asia and I went out to little communities where they were so poor, they hardly had the shirt on their back and the roof over their head, but they were, you know, they're happy. And as you were saying, they're vibrant. And apart from sort of hygienic issues and nutritional deficiencies, they're actually very robust, most of them in terms of their health and their well-being. And and so that fascinated me. So I came back and studied Ayurvedic medicine formally and then uh, started to put the whole pieces of the the bigger picture, the purpose in life um, with that sort of Eastern Ayurvedic background. And what were the qualities that you specifically observed uh, in in these people when you were in Southeast Asia? Mm. Well, two of the biggest ones I, with my research, that differentiate those long-living, what we would consider healthy cultures in terms of they're actually happy and um, compared to our very high disease culture here in the West, obviously there's the main ones that we hear about all the time in terms of fresh food and they've got fresh flowing water and fresh air and countryside and things. But the real two distinguishing factors were the sense of community. So their family connections and their social ties were just, that's the foundation of their whole life. And the second one was their value of ageing in their community. So in the West, of course, it's youth obsessed. You know, once we start getting to our 40s and 50s and 60s, we're generally seen as less useful in society. Age is something we try and distance ourselves from and keep at bay. Whereas in these cultures, the older one gets, the more venerated you are, the more accepted for your wisdom and your experience. And and so it's a whole different shift in terms of the mind-body connection. So in the West, we tend to age more because of that stress of we're getting older. Whereas in these cultures, it's, you know, something to look forward to and impart your wisdom to the younger generation. So um, it was really, really beautiful. Mm, Yeah. I spoke to uh, Hector Garcia a few weeks Mm. ago, who's the author of Ikigai. Mm. And he was uh, telling me about an island in in Japan. Yes. Okawana. Okinawa. Oh, Good. Yes. I'm glad you're here to correct me. I just couldn't get it then. Yeah. But yeah, he he uh, his thoughts very much uh, resonated with what you just said, and mm. his research very much supported what you just said with regards to the connection between our ikigai, our sense of purpose, yes. uh, and our ability to live long, healthy, and happy lives. Mm, absolutely, and uh, and Okinawa's quite a famous one, but there's a number of similar cultures in um, Ecuador and. Um, in Russia, parts of Russia, obviously 
Sardinia and Italy and Grace Halsell was a great journalist many years ago and she went to the Vilcabamban tribe in Ecuador and they have a saying called the Vihejo, which is the old ones when they reach 100 years and it's all about that and that was her really, her same um, input was that from her experience of actually living with them for many years, that it was their sense of community and connection and we know in the West the latest research is that we're the most disconnected society ever you know, even though we have Facebook and Instagram, Mm. in terms of social isolation and the feeling of loneliness, they're the biggest killers even above obesity and cigarette smoking these days. So she um, focused on that and also this, you know, as we age, you know, how we're respected and venerated in our communities as the big distinguishing factors. So, yeah, backing up what what he said, perfect. So, Mark, I've um, found in having numerous conversations about purpose that for most people – there's a, a significant point or, or a turning point that really acts as a catalyst uh, for the activation of purpose in in your life. Now, you've just spoken about the trip to Southeast Asia, which I know was one of those poignant times for you. Mm. However, I know that you also lost your wife as a re- result of uh, stress-related breast cramp breast cancer. Yeah. And I'm sure that that is something that's also informed your purpose and the work that you do today. Absolutely. It's really honed in the fact of um, we can do what most of us consider being healthy today. You know, we think as soon as we mention health, people think of eating healthy foods, getting some exercise, you know, maybe meditating, whatever it is. But what really the experience with Karen brought home, she was actually doing all of that when we met. But for the preceding seven years, she was in a basically a work environment, a life environment where significant like toxic stress on a day-to-day basis. And then of course you come home on the weekend and you're still swimming in that stress because you're worried about what's going to happen the following week. So to me, it really brought home the fact, and again, it's these long living healthy cultures tend to not necessarily not have any stress in their life, but because of that sense of community and closeness they have, they're able to ride out the ups and downs of life far better. So it was really, um, yeah, it certainly was a big step in my um, purposeful activity in terms of imparting knowledge that health is not just about eating the right foods and getting the exercise. It's that contentment in our hearts and, you know, doing what we're passionate about and not being in jobs that are toxic and not in relationships that are toxic. Um, We do the best we can to heal them and fix them. But if we can't, better just leave a simple, happy life than... uh, trying to do too much and creating stress from it. Mm. And and I think while on the subject of stress, in looking at stress through the lens of purpose, I I imagine Mm. in some ways a small amount of stress is something that you can use to enhance productivity if you can channel it in the right way. Mm. However, it would also be something that could fundamentally block our ability to live on purpose. Absolutely. Yeah, it's it's a balancing act. You know, we think of people like, I think of Joan of Arc, you know, and you know, you would think from one perspective, a huge amount of stress. But the experience I imagine for her was that she was so on purpose that for her not to do that activity would actually have been far more stressful. Mm. So we have to distinguish between stress as in um, that sort of feedback. In Ayurvedic medicine, big understanding of purpose is just our body is an intelligent organism and it will give us feedback about what's right for us to do in any moment of our life, whether it's what food to eat, what relationships, what work to be in. And so our purpose is exactly the same. There's a sort of inner resonance and harmony where our body knows we're doing the right thing. Now, that activity might involve some significant stress, for want of a better word, or challenges or obstacles to be overcome, but it's quite different to that being in a work or on a path that we just know it's not right for us Mm. and that's creating a different type of stress that's sort of as if eating away at us. So that distinguishing factor is really important. And I think uh, one of the things that Eastern medicine I think highlights so beautifully is the awareness of self. Mm. Um, And when I talk about purpose through through the lens of what you just said, uh, I talk about what I call PQ, which is the purpose quotient. Yes. And it's our ability, firstly, to think, so be clear on our narrative of purpose, 
But then it's also our, our ability to tune into our heart energy. Mm. And does this feel open and joyful or does it feel closed off? Am mm. I feeling heavy in this? Uh, you know, if we look at gut health as an example, yeah. the gut produces, uh, there's been a huge amount of research into gut health and the production of serotonin. But on an instinctual level, how does my gut feel mm. about this particular situation, person, place? You know, we've all had the experience of going, you know, I, I knew that felt yeah. wrong or my yeah. gut was saying just do that <laughs> and not taking that action. And I think it speaks directly to what you're talking about there. Yes, and that's beautifully summed up because basically that is the Eastern tradition that they come from the perspective of the, the essential foundation of life is non-physical, whereas in the West we've come from the perspective of microscopes and things in Petri dishes and telescopes that we start on the superficial, physical, tangible, concrete level and we try and dig down into deeper levels of nature's functioning to try and find the essential source of it, whereas the East Eastern tradition has been the exact opposite. Mm. You know, you start with consciousness, the non-physical, you meditate as you touched on, you have that experience of silence first so that the heart can actually speak. And this is the first step that they would say in finding our purpose because as I'm sure you get every week, well, Beck, well, how do I know what my mm. purpose is? You know, And it's not a rational, logical thing we can work out in our head. It's something that has to come from the heart and that silence. One of my favourite quotes from all time is by Claude Debussy and he says, music is the space between the notes. And so if all we have is the notes, it's just a jumbled mess. There's mm. no music and life is the no same. harmony. Yeah. yeah. If all we have in life is activity, which is our Western model, particularly in business, you know, you've got to work harder, you've got to do more, push KPIs, work, work, more activity. But if we keep um, basically honouring the altar of octi- uh, um, activity, the altar of activity, we just don't have that space and that silence, which is where all the richness and all the beauty and all the insights and the great aha moments that the great Mm. scientists and philosophers and the great sages throughout time have really thought of things or had ideas that have changed the whole course of Mm. history. And that's also the same formula for us to get in touch with what our higher purpose is. Absolutely. It's often in that space in between that the golden nuggets Mm. of purpose will literally drop in. But if you don't stop and give yourself the time and space to to be in that, then, you know, you're not giving purpose a space to land in either. Exactly. Yeah. Beautiful. So in diving into the world of ancient wisdom, you're a practitioner of Maharishi Ayurveda. Mm Mm-hmm. Did I pronounce that correctly? Very nice, very nice. <laughs> I've been worried about that all morning. <laughs> My initial assumption was that Ayurveda was a spiritual philosophy, and in some ways that may be true. However, the direct translation uh, of Ayurveda into English is the science of life, which mm. I found quite fascinating. I have a few questions diving into the various components of Ayurveda. However, as a starting point, can you give our listeners an overview of this ancient wisdom with a focus on how we can use this practice to deepen our connection to purpose? Beautiful. So I want all your listeners to imagine before we dive into a definition, because that's what most people hear about Ayurveda. I want you to think of a time where you have been completely silent. You're on a holiday on a beautiful beach and you're just quiet, and it's if your mind just settles down, settles down, settles down, settles down, and it's if the whole intelligence of the universe comes into your awareness. You know, there might be beautiful mountains outside, sunlight, fresh air, but you're in this just beautiful, peaceful inner awareness. And like those ancient scientists we spoke about, where you get these little aha moments, these like little insights of knowledge or wisdom on a certain aspect of life where, as you said before, Beck, just resonating in your gut is that this is absolutely truth, whether it's true for everyone or you're just you yourself. That essentially is Ayurvedic medicine. So Ayurveda is designed, design, uh, defined, as you said, science of life, but in fact, on a deeper level, It's the actual laws of nature that structure our whole universe. And so Ayurveda is not a science that came about because people experimented things and then wrote down their results or they, over time, they formulated these ideas and put them into books. It's basically a revelation of reality. So the ancient rishis, they were called. A rishi means a seer. 
So they're not seers that see with the eye, they're seers that see with the eye of consciousness. And so in deep meditation, having really refined nervous system over many, many years, they're literally able to experience the laws of nature that structure all of life. And so Ayurveda is those laws of nature, particularly related to health and well-being. So daily cycles, how the human body is designed to live in tune with those cycles, that we eat food at a certain time of day when the digestion's at its peak, we go to bed at certain times in tune with the natural cycles. And when we do all these things that Ayurveda has prescribed for, for since the dawn of time, basically, we, we flow with life. And the analogy I use in my seminars is like a wave on the ocean. You imagine a wave on the ocean. We have two choices as humans. We can fight the wave. We can try and swim against it. We can try and duck under it. We can do whatever we want. But that's hard work. You know, we get crashed by the waves and we get beaten down by the waves and it's stressful and we get a mouthful of water and we say, bloody hell, never going to do this again. Or we can actually turn around and swim or surf with the wave. And if we do that, then nature, nature does all the work. The experience for us is that life's enjoyable. It's easy. There's a flow to it. And in terms of health and well-being in Ayurveda, everything flows. So we digest food when it's designed to be digested. We sleep when it's time to sleep. In the morning, we wake up and the body naturally eliminates the wastes and everything flows. So a lot of the illnesses that we see today can be eliminated because we're not fighting mother nature. So that's the the essence of mm. it. Yeah, that there's such a beautiful analogy and one of the reasons I really wanted to speak to you about this subject is because I really do a like and purpose to being that wave. Mm, absolutely. And that some part of the activation of purpose is is allowing ourselves through the different tools that, that we're talking about today, mm. like meditation as an example, to learn how we tune in to that life force and listen to that mm. because that's where rather than waiting for purpose or finding purpose, we're actually connecting and tuning in to purpose that is already there for us, already a part of this unique and magical blueprint that is life. Beautiful. If we're able to find that space in between to to enable that connection. Absolutely beautifully, yeah, mm. beautifully put. And it's, yeah, it's all about the silence and the gaps. And the other analogy I use is like a river. You know, a river that's flowing will actually attract all the streams and the tributaries to it. So it will get fed by all those other aspects. And that's the central role of purpose in Ayurvedic medicine. Today, many people think, oh, if I'll just get my diet right and then once I've got good energy and you know, all that thing's in place, then I'll focus on my purpose. Whereas Ayurveda says, no, purpose or what they call dharma, the word in Vedic mm, tradition is word. dharma. And that root da comes from dri, which is to support or uphold. And what's it upholding? It's upholding our whole evolution as a human being. And that's the whole vision of life from Vedic medicine is that we're here to evolve to higher states of consciousness. And our dharma, or our purpose, is the central theme in our life. That's why we're put on this planet. That's why we're born. And so our diet and our exercise and all these things we do are really supports for our dharma, not the other way around. And so this is the real the real shift. And as you say, it comes from those little moments of solitude or silence or feeling the, the heart. Absolutely. And and I think it also connects why health is purpose and purpose is health. Mm, absolutely. As well. Mm. So in, in researching for today's podcast, I was watching your speaking presentation where you broke down the three energy types or doshas. Doshas, correct. That's correct. Yes, <laughs> beautiful. <laughs> that, that make up the human energy grid. So uh, my understanding was that in Ayurveda, we are working with the elements of space air, fire, water, and earth, and that these elements are broken down in, into what is called the vata, pitta, and kapha. kapha. <laughs> Did I get that right? The first you heard my good. whole voice <laughs> go up. <laughs> what, what's the third one? Maybe correct me um, on that. Kapha. Kapha. Yes. Okay. Yes. I'll work on that throughout the rest of the podcast. <laughs> so as a starting point, can you talk me through how these three doshas inform our personality types and how we can identify what type of dosha we are in, in alignment with? Beautiful. It is a whole 
major seminar in itself, but we can do it very quickly. So we start with that foundation you mentioned, that space, air, fire, water, earth. So the Ayurvedic cognition of these great rishis was that everything in our universe is composed of nothing than these five elements. The sun represents the fire element. The mountains and the earth is obviously the earthy element. We have the wind, you know, the movement, and obviously all contained in space. On an individual human level, of course, we look around and we're all different. You know, some are tall, some are short, some are big, some are small, blonde hair, brown hair, no hair, Mm. like me. And so the way Ayurveda understands this is by the question, well, who am I talking to? In Ayurvedic medicine, the first question is not, what's wrong with you? It's, who am I talking to? Because three people can present with exactly the same symptoms, the same thing wrong, and have completely different regimes to address that. And so understanding what we call our body type or our underlying constitution is the first step in Ayurveda. And so space and air, when they combine, they're most readily seen in this vata principle. We can use the term airy for a sort of just a quick, sort of easier Mm -hmm. to grasp. Fire element is obviously related or most readily seen in this idea of pitta. Pitta or the fire element is what transforms things. It processes one thing into another. Vata or air is what obviously communicates, you know, it's movement, it's flow. And so in the body, it's um, elimination of wastes, it's helping with the digestion of food, it's processing light and movement. And, and then kapha is earth and water. So the kapha or the earthy element is what we use to actually build a physical body. So mm-hmm. the actual muscles and the joints. and But of course, everyone is different and we have a different proportion of these three governing principles, we call them. So some people are more vata or airy by nature. So when they're even when they're in a balanced state from birth, you know, they're just more bubbly. You know, you go mm. to a party and the party's a bit sort of dull, and then Beck or someone else who's they got a bit of vata, in. you float in and they're bubbly. <laughs> Hello, darling, and they kiss everyone yeah, and they're gesticulating and they, yeah, everywhere, exactly. knock a few glasses yeah, over. Yeah, I absolutely. think I have some of that. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and they liven up the party. They're effervescent. They, you know, put the music on, they start dancing. So they make great dancers and musicians and artists. They've got really creative spirit. Often talk about business. You have a business meeting and all the vatas come up with a great creative ideas. They don't implement them, but they come up with them. Five mm. minutes later, they're on to the next thing. Yeah. Okay. But when they're in balance, really, they're a light build. They don't put on weight easily. They're type of people I call bastards. You know, they can eat whatever they want, never <laughs> yeah. put on weight. Um, and then the pitters with that fire element, you know, they make really great business people and athletes and entrepreneurs. They're very focused and they've got that strong make intellect. Stuff happen. Yeah. They've got a lot of, they're very heat sensitive. So they're, they're really dynamic and competitive and Great, but they're passionate. When they're in balance, really big passion. They start big projects and they fantastic. And then the cuffers, the earthy types, they're often the more behind-the-scene types, you know. They're down to earth, they're reliable, they're really dependable, really sweet nature because of that earthy element. So they often make great sort of finance support or admin support, teachers, nurses. You think of the big matronly nurse. Mm, it's like that nurturing, yeah, mothering nurturing, energy. Nurturing, beautiful, nourishing energy. Mm. So when they're in balance, also great endurance, you know, they're sort of elephant memory. Once they get something stuck, they never forget it. They start things slowly, but once they start, they can just go all day. But of course, depending on what climate we live in, in terms of the weather, whether it's hot, cold, windy, the type of food we eat, the type of exercise we do, the type of relationships and work we're in, we can actually develop imbalances. So for the airy types, if they eat what's commonly recommended as a healthy diet today or has been until recently, minimal fat, minimal salt, no sugar, um, raw foods, they, and I see them all the time Mm. when I consult, They'll get migraines and their memory will be bad and they'll get dry, rough skin and dandruff and they won't sleep well because there's too much space and air. It's like they're floating, floating away off. into space. Yeah, yeah. They, need, they need that grounding they need energy. grounding, yeah. yeah. So they need more nourishing food and sort of come home at the end of the day and you don't talk to them, you just give them a nice cuff of earthy hug and a nice oil massage and sweet foods and so they need that. Pitters, of course, their main imbalance is usually related to heat. 
So you imagine you see it in all the time, the middle of cities, you know, the pitta man or woman, they're really business focused and they'll come out in the middle of the day in the hot sun in their lunch break and they'll run around and do five kilometre jog and they'll come yep. back and their face will be all beetroot red and they'll be then they'll go and have some Mexican or Indian for dinner. And the I'm thinking about the entrepreneur out archetype. Exactly. Out there, go, go, go. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and they're also all the ones that often do the big self-development courses or, mm. you know, so think of Wim Hof, you know, Wim Hof's famous for his ice baths. So he's fantastic for him because he's got so much pitta, the ice baths is a good way to Straight cool him there. down. Yeah. But for a vata type that's out of balance and is really sensitive to the cold and doesn't have much body fat, ice baths need to be much more careful for him. Same with fasting. Fasting's a big one today. We hear about intermittent fasting. Mm. So for the earthy types, Quite regular fasting is a really, really good thing because they're hypometabolic. So it means they they keep things to them, particularly weight. You know, they're more prone to diabetes. They need more stimulation in their diet and digestion. So fasting, intermittent fasting, great. But again, for the for the airy types, you know, that don't put on weight easily and they're away with the fairies, for them they've got to be really, really careful with things like fasting. So this is just gives us a guide for how, one, we're all different, Two, that we're different in different ways and understanding Mm. what our strengths and tendencies are and then how to balance it is really important. And thirdly, comes back to what the whole premise of what we started with is the best way to understand what our nature is and what our imbalances are is just to listen to our body. So better than a book, better than listening to my podcasts, anything like that, Mm. is just tune in, you know. Am I feeling dull and sort of heavy and sort of, lacklustre, then too much earth, too much kapha. So we want to stimulate it with more spicy food, a bit more chilli in the diet, maybe a bit of ginger, you know, more vigorous exercise, mix things up in the work front. If we're overheated, you know, in the middle of summer and the sort of steam's coming out of our ears, we can eat cooling foods. So good quality dairy, if you can find it, leafy greens, anything coconut type products, take heat out of the body. And if we're just listening in and we're feeling really restless and we can't sleep and we're biting our nails and really sort of stressed and anxious, then we want to balance vata. Just more regular routines, sweet, nourishing foods, earlier to bed, doing some yoga or meditation instead of the high intensity spin class and having the pitta instructor yelling at the top of their voice at you to go faster, just calming and chilling and yeah. And what I love about this philosophy is it enables you to just let go of the guilt Mm. and the shoulds and the shouldn'ts and kind of just listen to your body. Mm, Absolutely. (laughs) Like it seems so simple, doesn't it? But we all get so caught up in, you know, following this diet or I haven't gone to the gym every day to do my weights or Mm. whatever it is rather rather than sort of asking like what do I need at this point Mm. in time? Yeah, beautiful. And it's in Ayurveda they call it self-referral consciousness. Mm. So instead of referring to something external, the book or the podcast or the expert in inverted commas, we refer inwardly to ourself. And there's a famous aphorism in Ayurveda that goes along the lines of everything is inside. You know, the human body is an infinitely intelligent organism. And in every moment of every day, it's telling us what we need for balance. Mm. You know, when we're tired, we rest. When we're thirsty, we have some water. When we're hungry, we eat some food. And it doesn't get much more complicated than that unless we make it so. Mm. so uh, and look, the other component I loved uh, when you spoke about each personality profile uh, within within each flow of energy was that that is a tool if we're able to identify which dosha we are mm. predominantly in alignment with, that that might actually give us a few clues around what our purpose might be. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, now, you spoke very specifically about the grounding nature and that being nurturing and mothering or the fire being all about taking action and, and getting out there and maybe uh, doing activities that really allow you to step into that that warrior energy mm. almost, yep. or then the airy types who sound like more like the, the people, the charismatic people People person, that wasn't yeah. the right way of saying that, but you know what I mean. Yeah, so. <laughs> they are people, absolutely yeah. people. They connect people and they it's that um, communication. So they bring people together and also have that that creative energy. So they new ideas and that sort of thing. So absolutely it gives us a really good guide 
to that. And the other aspect, which I'm sure you've gone through with other presenters, is the idea of just what are we naturally good at? So mm-hmm. the questions we ask is what do I act- actually love to do? Because that's obviously green light. So one column is what we just love to do. Time flies, you know, we lose ourselves in. The one other one is what are we naturally good at, which is not necessarily the same. And this is often a good question to get other people to Give you answer feedback. for you, give you feedback, mm. you know. So you mightn't see it yourself, but what do other people compliment you on? Say, Beck, you are just so fantastic at that. I can't believe how you do it with. And you're thinking, I just doesn't do not do it naturally, you know. I don't even, I don't think, even think about, about that. that. Yeah, yeah, there's no effort, there's no strain, there's this flow element to it. The third one is what am I absolutely uniquely able to do? And Tim Ferriss does this really well. He had, had a, I don't know if you know this story, but um, he tells it in Tools of St- Titans, one of his latest books about how he was considering whether he should go down the venture capitalist path because he was really good as a venture capitalist and he was sort of had a felt he had a good talent for it. But that was taking away from his sort of health and his sort of, you know, what he did with his books and his seminars. And a friend of his said, Tim, if you gave up VC, venture capital work tomorrow, no one would notice the difference. But if you gave up your health stuff, writing your books and doing your talks, which help people transform their lives, I've seen it in, you know, right in front of my eyes, mm. that would be an absolute travesty. And so asking ourselves the question, could I be replaced if I stopped this tomorrow is a really powerful question because our true purpose is something we are uniquely designed for. No one else in the world on the planet can do it quite like we can. And that's what we really mm. want to find. I love that. Uh, I often talk about purpose as being our DNA. And I think mm. that speaks to that idea beautifully because it is it is this unique code that, yep. you know, there, there are various things that influence that code, but it, it is mm. it is inherently ours. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Beautiful. So, you know, I'm a big believer in uh, ancient wisdom. And so I want to to, I guess, go on a bit of a journey through the three doshas so that we can understand how we can use each energy to be able to enhance our purpose. So Vata governs our ability to move and to communicate. Does that mean if we're having, for example, challenges, say, moving forward with our purpose or expressing our purpose to others that we can tap into Vata in order to activate that part of ourselves? Uh, To some degree, yes. So really good to understand that we are comprised of all three of the governing principles. So no one's just vata or just pitta Mm. or just kapha. All of us need a physical body to live. All of us need some fire element to digest food and convert it into energy to process light. The skin and the liver are all pitta organs. And we all need some movement and communication so that things can flow and move and get rid of waste. So we have all three It's just that the proportion varies within us. And so how we use the principle you've just touched on is, for example, if someone is lacking that creative energy or, you know, they're feeling sort of dull and cloudy and that creativity is not working, we would generally associate that with a kapha imbalance. There's too much kapha. And the exact opposite of kapha is vata. Mm. The opposite of earth is space and air. I often talk about this when we talk about earthing and the need to ground ourselves. When we can't sleep, what do we say? Oh, I'm away with the fairies. I'm so spacey. I just can't sleep. And you can down. see it in people as well when Absolutely. they've lost that grounding because they'll almost look absent in, in the eyes. Yeah. And they can't remember mm. things. They can all, almost can't remember their own name. Mm. And so earth is exact opposite. And so Beautifully, the same in reverse. So someone's too much kapha, they're feeling dull, inertia, lacklustre, they can't sort of get moving. Yes, they will bring in more of the vata elements. So a lighter diet. So them, less fat in the diet, less ice cream and the heavy foods, more sort of, as we said, chilli and gingers and stimulating spices to get that metabolism going. In terms of exercise, rather than doing the relaxing, calming, lie in the hammock or do the relaxing yoga, for them more stimulating exercise, the spin class or getting out and having a jog, Mm. that sort of thing. And same in work. That's when they would try and take on a more challenging project. And so even things like coffee for the kapha types, the earthy, a little bit of coffee, perfectly good and balancing for them. 
for the airy types, not so not good, so good. Generally speaking, so, yeah. But that's how we can use those Vata principles to bring in more creativity and sort of that more lightness and into someone with that sort of disposition Amazing. or imbalance. Yeah, and important to note that that we're working with the system as a Absolutely. whole. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And we see it in relationships too. And that's you know you look at any really solid, you know, whether it's a, a love relationship or a work relationship. We really see where these principles beautifully complement each other. So in a business environment, you know, the pitters are often those ones that will want to go out and do the sales and they'll create the deals. But the vatas have had the ideas initially and then the cuffers are the ones that just keep everyone grounded, you know. They're mm-hmm. sort of making sure everything's stable behind the scenes and, um, and in a love relationship often the cuffer types are what balance the pitta types out because if they don't have that balance, they get too serious and it's they workaholics and they never stop and they never have downtime. And then the vatas bring that fun element, you know, so they bring the fun and the play and, you know, life's not all about work and being too serious. And so often you'll see a nice balance with these in, in relationships as well. So if I look at purpose, I often think of purpose as a transformational force in that it enables us to create a vision for the future and in the present moment take the action in order to bring that future into our lives, to manifest that purpose. And it's the yeah. action that I believe is is purpose itself. That is mm. the energy we experience when we're on purpose. Now, Because it is transformative in that we're seeing a new future and building a path to become that future, sometimes in that process we need to let go of unconscious uh, belief systems, emotions. We need to do the work. We Mm. need to do some healing. Now, as as an Ayurvedic uh, professional, if if that's such a thing, practitioner is probably the word I was looking at, but both work. Um, and also a meditation teacher. What's your advice uh, for people who are wanting to create a new pathway forward and possibly needing to step into that transformation to make that happen? Yeah. First step is for me is the space. Yeah. We touched on that earlier. Um, Space can have a different or some different elements. One is just simply physical space. We all have had the experience where Life's getting on top of us. We're not clear what the purpose is, what the vision is, that pathway. We go on a holiday. We get out of our current environment, you know, preferably overseas, the further away the better, and then we tend to see our life from that distant perspective, you know. So it's like the Mm -hmm. old analogy, working on the business, not in the business. So space, physical space, is the first step to get that perspective. The other element of space is um, is the meditation. So transcending, experience what Ayurvedic medicine calls the self. The self is that source of all our mind, emotions, thinking, ideas. So if we can nourish that, develop that, then those thought patterns, those ideas crystallize in our awareness better. And so that's what is going to give us that direction. And then the third level is just the gut instinct. Again, we come back to the same principle, but it's because it is so fundamental Mm. that in every moment, nature is guiding us as to the right path Path. to take. And so it's just listening to that feedback. It's a gut feeling, that intuitive feeling in the heart that we just, yes, this is the right path. Even though we might know the end goal, where it's going to lead, we know it's the right direction and then often what happens, one step leads to the next and leads to the next and leads to the next because our ultimate purpose might not come in one step and that's, Mm. I think, what you're alluding to. There's going to be healing needs to be done on the way. If we know we're meant to be a a doctor or a healer of people, you know, there's a time where you have to study first. You've got to gain the knowledge before you can actually do the action Mm. principle. And so if you're a parent... You know, you don't just go straight into being a parent. You've got to find a partner and you have that relationship and you develop the love and connection between you first and then you go through the process to conceive and so there's a process in it. So it's a matter of, yeah, that little step-by-step tuning in and following the, the heart wisdom. Absolutely. And, and I think it also links back to the self-awareness piece again, mm. you know, the number of times I, for example, have had people say, you know, I want to be a speaker. Mm. And I'll often say, well, you know, you're in the spotlight when you're, in, yeah. you know, when you're a speaker. And within that, 
people can see your shadow. Yeah. Um, as, as a metaphor for exactly what we're talking about, if you want to be mm. seen in your purpose, then you also need to have the ability to be conscious of where you need to evolve on and what you need to work on in order to Beautiful. be seen and heard in that work. Beautiful. Yeah. And it's not always about what people think it is. They might want to be the speaker because they see that as supposedly glamorous and mm. they make a certain amount of money, or but it's the message behind it that is usually what's connected to the purpose. Mm. And so the Dharma or the purpose is what sits behind. The speaking is just the vehicle. The mechanism, Whereas that's right. someone's, um, someone's Dharma may actually be more as a writer or small group facilitator or, you know, a various different vehicle. So it's not only just getting what we're good at, what we love, but there's also the vehicle by which we deliver it, which will have a dharmic or a purpose to it, and also then who is the end user. So there might be three different speakers that that's their dharma to speak, but one's dharma is to work with underprivileged kids. That's what they were Mm. designed. Others is to work with mums and dads. Others to work with high-level business people or athletes. And so so it's who we're working with also has that element of of dharma or purpose. Definitely. And I think that human experience, that human impact, that human transformation is actually what uh, distinguishes purpose from, say, vision, mission and values. Mm. Yep. is exactly what you're talking about. How does this mm. inspire or transform another human being? And I think that's yep. true for personal purpose, but it's also true for brand purpose or organisational purpose mm. as well. Absolutely. And, yeah, and that's what we'd call the highest purpose because it's it's service. You know, yep. in the Eastern traditions they call it, you know, it's karma basically mm. as we put out so we get back. And the greatest source of dharma or purpose is karma. You yeah. know? And so they sort of go together. So beautiful. I think one of the beautiful things about the emergence of purpose and the future of work at large is that we are beginning to place value on the depth of what it is to be human. With that, we are seeing an increased focus on self-care, uh, deep and meaningful communication and the practice of mindfulness in the workplace. Now, all of these things are undeniably good for the human beings working inside of a business. So my question uh, for you is around the direct return on investment for leaders out there looking to understand more about the importance of health in the workplace, especially with regards to how these practices can assist both leaders and employees to become more connected to a purpose. Mm. Well, beautiful. And I think you, in a sense, answered it in your previous comments is that our purpose here is not just the bottom line. Mm. Okay. That's a very narrow view that, you know, and we've all been through it. You know, sometimes we have to be very narrow in our life if we're raising kids and you've got to put food on the table. But our deeper purpose is, as we touched on earlier, individually to evolve ourselves, to become more mindful, to become more conscious, to become more aware, to evolve. But also the way we do that is to help others evolve and become more aware. And so as business leaders, I think we're getting to that point now where they're actually starting to see that, that as part of their responsibility is to create an environment in our workplaces and offices that we can help those individuals, not just do the job they're being paid to do, but actually evolve and become more conscious beings at the same time. And of course, it's the paradox of nature. It's a win-win, you know. So as they do that, they actually become better employees generally anyway and more productive and more efficient and more caring and connected to the actual company. So it comes back both ways. So um, yeah, it's a nice tie-in. And I, and I have to ask you, because one of the things I think you've done beautifully as a, as a speaker and an influencer is translate Eastern tradition into the Western corporate world. Mm. How well has that been received? <laughs> because, you know, that, that's a, that's your gift. And, and I think having seen you speak a few times, I think you do that so well. Yeah. Well, I always remember... Um, the guy who brought transcendental meditation to the West many, many years ago, his name was Maharishi Mahesh Yogi. And his famous, one of his most famous sayings was his greatest passion in life was to make the difficult simple. So back when he came out, meditation was this complicated, you know, I had to go to the mountains and it was sort of, you needed to be disciplined and it took 20 years to get a result. And he said, no, 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 no. Meditation is the most simple thing in the world. You know, you just trans. And so that's, a big part of my purpose. That's just my unique skill set. I can tend to take these somewhat 
complicated or austere or metaphysical things and chunk them down into bite-sized chunks. But it's really, really interesting because about the last 12 months, about three different speaker bureaus, obviously you'd know when we go to speak and you're booked by a speaker bureau, they'll get feedback from the client and you'll get evaluated. And about three times in the last 12 months, speaker bureaus have rung me up and said, Mark, what are you, what are you doing now? You know, your, your feedback at talks has been just amazing. amazing. And I say, you know what? I'm almost doing exactly what I was telling people 20 years ago, but it's just that the consciousness, the awareness is growing. So and true. And so I was, I was really left field 20 years ago. Yeah. I was like- You were like the hippie them, in the yeah. corner. <laughs> I was like crazy. I was like the crazy. But now it's like what I've been saying is, is starting to resonate in people. And so I'm not doing anything different. There's nothing exciting about what I'm saying. It's just I think there's a collective sort of resonance more and an awareness of these traditional ancient mm. wisdoms have a lot to be, um, you know, validity to them. So Absolutely. it's really exciting. So while on the subject of meditation, um, we've already spoken about the fact you're a teacher of Mm. Transcendental Meditation and you are also the CEO of the David Lynch Foundation Australia. So DLFA is a non-for-profit charity that helps reduce trauma and toxic stress in at-risk populations through evidence-based stress management techniques, including the meditation program. Mm. So as a starting point, for, for those listeners out there who maybe have no experience of meditation, Meditation. What is transcendental meditation? And for those of us, including myself, with like manic monkey brains, <laughs> yeah. how can we use this practice uh, in order to be able to heal from trauma, to manage stress, or, or just to shut up the monkeys? You yeah. know. <laughs> well, it's a really interesting you talk about the monkey mind because again, Marishi, who brought transcendental meditation out to the West, he has again this beautiful analogy, and it's if you're a gardener. You imagine you've got a tree in your backyard and you want the tree to be really healthy and robust and give you beautiful fruit. We don't go to the tree and water all the different branches and leaves and fruit. If we do that, the tree will die. What we do is we actually water what we can't see with the naked eye. And that's the roots that lie underground. Mm -hmm. So his analogy is water the roots to enjoy the fruits. And it's the exact opposite of what we've been, again, told in our Western world. You know, if you want success, you've got to go and work hard at this area. You've got to go and do your exercise here and you've got to eat well here and you've got to work and raise your family. And we basically race around doing all these different parts, but we don't nourish the actual source of all of those parts. And in the Vedic tradition, that part is consciousness, the non-physical, unseen, unbounded source of mind, body, and emotion. So transcendental meditation is a technique, a very specific technique that transcends, that's where the word comes from, transcend means to go beyond. What do we go beyond? Meditation. Meditation means to actually think. I'm going to meditate on something. So in TM, the idea is not to think. So we get a mantra, which is just a specific sound that allows the mind to settle down. So instead of like the surface of an ocean, which is all active mm, and, that's and like dynamic, the um. Um, a mantra is a sound that doesn't have a meaning in right. TM. Right. So okay. because if we have a meaning, the mind will associate with that meaning. It'll start thinking of flowers if it's flower. Or, and so the idea is it has a vibration or a resonance, which helps the mind mm. calm down, settle. And it's like going from the surface of an ocean. Marshi analogy is... The mind is like the surface of an ocean or an ocean. And the surface, busy, turbulent, active, but we drop an anchor. It's like the mantra. allows the mind to settle down. And at the bottom of the ocean, the ocean's completely calm, silent, steady. And so his key point was that by nature, our minds are not a monkey mind. We're only a monkey mind when the mind hasn't found a source that's giving more charm or bliss. It's like a bee. A bee will only fly around on different flowers until it finds what it's looking for. Once it's found the nectar, it'll stop and it's happy. And it's the same with the mind. So Marshi says the nature of the mind is to go to more happiness, more bliss, more charm. If you're in a library and you're reading a book and it's not very exciting and someone turns on some beautiful music, your mind will effortlessly go to the music. 
No effort required. It's just its nature. The music becomes a bit dull and you open the window and there's that beautiful, innocent laughter of kids playing outside. Our mind will innocently or effortlessly go to that. And so all we need to do is give it the direction and that direction is inward. So that's what TM is, a very simple, natural, effortless technique that allows the mind to go from the surface levels to the depths. It experiences what we call restful alertness. So we're actually deep rest, physical body, deep rest, but the mind is awake and it's alert. And scientists have actually now shown that this is a distinct fourth state of human consciousness. 99.9% of our whole world population live our whole lives in three states of consciousness, waking, dreaming, or sleeping. But there's a whole fourth state called transcendental consciousness or pure consciousness, which all the Eastern traditions and all the great philosophers and yogis and spiritual masters have talked about and instructed their students for thousands of years that this is essential. Unless we can experience this, then we can't fully live our potential in the other three Mm. states. And so that's what TM is. It's a practical tool to experience that twice a day. And then over time, we actually develop a fifth state of consciousness called cosmic consciousness, where we become completely established in that state. And what Ayurvedic medicine calls swasta. Sta is the root for establish, stable, steady. What are we established in? Swa, which is the self. And so that's the whole purpose. We become established in that, like the eye of the hurricane, regardless of what's happening in our life and all the stress and Mm. the madness and the craziness, like the great yogis of times past, we're steady and stable within ourselves within that. So that's the purpose. Beautiful. So twice a day, is there a set time limit on that? Like how do do you make that happen? Yeah. So TM's um, taught over four days. It's a course. So people go for four days for about 90 minutes a day. First day you get the mantra and the instruction of how to use it. And then the following three days are about how to do it at home and how long to do it. And usually it's ideally 20 minutes twice a day. We spoke earlier, I've just come back from um, the Knopf's Foundation mm, out in Liverpool in Western Sydney. Incredible human being. Yeah, they're absolutely amazing. Mm. But the idea there is we're at the moment teaching the staff who like look after Hundreds of kids that just come off the streets at the I end know of the what, day. As I and, said, I know yeah. what that's like because I was one of their staff. Yeah. So. <laughs> um, but the point being is yeah. that, you know, it's it, when you're there and the kids are there, it's just, it's mayhem. It, it so is, yes. For them to get two twice a day to get 20 minutes, it is really difficult sometimes. So that's the ideal. But like everything, we be practical mm. and sometimes people only get to do it for 10 minutes or 15 or, but um, the more they can do it the better it is. So, yeah. So tell me a little bit more about the work of the David Lynch Foundation. Mm. So David Lynch, of course, is a Hollywood film producer, um, Twin Peaks, Mulholland Drive, and he had been meditating doing TM for about 40-odd years. And about 15 years ago, he had this inspiration. He's a very, he's a just full of love. He's got the biggest heart in any person I think I've ever met. And he wanted to teach a million kids in the US, how to do TM. Because in America, the school system, the kids, violence, drugs, you know, we hear Mm. about it all the time. And so it was so successful that then they basically developed it into also treating um, domestic violence sufferers, um, war veterans who come back with post-traumatic stress. Because the beauty of TM is that it's um, effortless. You know, a lot of people think of meditation and think, oh, I can't meditate, I can't sit down for long enough, or I'm always thinking, the monkey mind. But TM is effortless. So even people that have significant trauma, as we said, domestic violence, post-traumatic stress, drug and alcohol abuse in their in their lives, they can still do it. So it's a really perfect technique for that. So about 15 years ago, they started in the US and now they're in about 35 different countries. And probably two years ago, we started in Australia. So um, I was asked to head things up here and it's um, it's been great and part of my purpose. So, Amazing. Um, yeah, it's been and do really you, good. Do you think meditation is something that we'll see uh, being rolled out in schools? And Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And it is now. Yeah, in many Fabulous. schools, whether it's mindfulness or TM or other, other techniques. And I think, you know, we can all see it, you know, kids, so much technology these days and so many demands on um, pressure. They need that, again, that silent time and as we discussed earlier. And that's Mother Nature's formula. You know, that's what I always try and bring home that Mother Nature's formula for success, whether that's 
business success or, or actual just happiness and peace is not activity. It's rest and activity. The higher we want the skyscraper, the deeper we have to dig down. Mm. The further we want to shoot an arrow on our bow, the further we have to pull it back. The more dynamic the activity, the more deeper the rest we need. And that's why so many successful business people and athletes are now taking the time to meditate because they know unless they nourish themselves, get that quiet, that sort of clarity of mind. And everyone I teach, every business person I teach says they're now more productive now that they meditate than before. So the 20 minutes twice a day is just the best investment for their time because they get much more done uh, in the rest of their day. So mm. um, I think it's going to be more and more, whether it's schools, business, every area of life. So, yeah, it's an exciting time. And, I mean, what you just said is is such a beautiful thing to remember about purpose as well, that mm. sometimes we will need to tap into that fiery make-it-happen energy, but that we also need to kick back, stop, rest, be still. Mm. And that is doing service to our purpose as much as, uh, you know, putting the head down and, and mm. being in the grind is making our purpose happen at the same time. So such a good, a good lesson on that front mm. as well. Uh, and also it's beautiful because that that sort of coming back to the self helps reset and recalibrate the purpose too mm. sometimes because, you know, purpose is True. not something that is a straight line. You know, it's not a road that just goes for our whole life. It has twists and turns and there's different elements just because you're a um, businesswoman that's, I mean, we heard about Lisa Messenger, yeah. you know, she's an entrepreneur to the entrepreneurs, but she might also be a mother and she might also be a sister and she might also work at the community centre. That's centre. right. We have lots of so different we might have types different of purpose. Purpose yeah. and dharma. And so having that recourse to ourself helps recalibrate or just make sure we're on the right track so we don't end up five years down the track completely on the wrong that's path. right. So um, another and benefit. I think in anchoring purpose as a tool to influence our decision making, mm. we can so easily get distracted by those bright, shiny objects in the corner. And I think it's happened to all of us. Mm. Um, as you're saying, allowing that space to actually sit back and go, actually, is that my purpose? Mm. Or was I just kind of taken on a bit of a side path there because yeah. it looked cool, but actually did that really resonate with me? Yeah. Um, is, is such an important thing if mm. we're looking at the power of purpose to influence ourselves. Absolutely, yeah. So a year or so back, you and I seeded a little idea and it was at the time an e-book on the future of, of health. And so there were a few amazing things in there such as um, brain mapping I think was one of them and you talked about the new technologies of transcendence was another and and the idea in the workplace that we would be looking to measure happiness over success. Mm. Uh, since then, ha- are there any trends or, you know, what, what can we expect from the future of health through the, through the lens of Mark Bum? Well, I would firstly like to say how amazing it was to spend that time with. That was really when we first met. It and was. And so I got a a great glimpse into your creative genius. And I don't use that term lightly, oh, thank but it you. was such a great one to have this perspective from someone outside, but you just had this unique, beautiful, different view of things. And it was very futuristic, but also grounded. So I really, really appreciated that thank back you. then. And so my view on the big trends is my number one is, is a reconnection with mother nature, but not in a airy, fairy, ancient wisdom, you know, you go out and sit in the cave, but it's an integration of nature into our modern workplace environments and our lives. So one of the biggest um, research things going on at the moment is something called nature immersion or forest bathing. People have heard about it. So in Japan in the 1980s, they had something called Shinrin-yoku, which was basically a very simple basic understanding that when you are connected to mother nature, your body heals itself. We don't even have to do anything. You know, it's not like we have to go earthing and take our shoes and socks off and sit on the ground. Basically, when we go into a natural environment, the plants and trees emit essential oils that we don't have to buy from the health food shop, but they heal us. The scents in a natural forest, the soil has its own microbiome that when we're in that natural environment, our own gut microbiota Mm. get healed and balanced. And there's now 
international or global institutes of forest bathing. San Francisco has its own forest that. bathing club. Yeah. The best one is in Scotland. Scottish doctors today can prescribe you as a patient to go and spend time in nature instead of prescribing you a pharmaceutical pill. Why? Because there's now so much science backing up that if we simply just be in a natural environment, whether it's a park or a forest, nature reserve, we actually heal immune system, less inflammation, anti-cancer proteins, natural killer cells for our immune system, mental health, anxiety, depression. In a business environment, they got people to spend four days without technology, nature immersion, 50% increase in problem solving, 50% increase in creativity. We know when we spend more time in nature, we become more intrinsically motivated, which is very much connected to our purpose. Purpose is connected to um, intrinsic motivation because it's connected to connection and caring and compassion for others. When we're disconnected from nature, the research shows that we become more extrinsically motivated, less caring, less community-minded, more selfish. So um, I think that's the big one. So things like green exercise, rather than just going to the gym and doing our gym training or doing a yoga class indoors, which are both fantastic, but combining them into what's now going to be called green exercise. So doing your gym or your um, strength training outdoors, you know, chin-ups on the trees, going for walks or hiking in natural environments. In Canada, they now, instead of having ice skating um, parks, you know, the little ice skating rinks, they now have little trails through the, the forests where it's, you know, ice trails and they do it through there. Beautiful. So combining them. So we're getting nature, but also our physical activity, bringing that into the workplace too, what they call biophilic design. So just having natural light, you know, recreating our office places so that there's natural light coming through, maybe a little communal space in the middle of our building where people can go on earth, get some fresh air, well, that was those my sort next, of things. Um, <clears throat> my next thing I was going to talk about, because when I was watching your keynote, you spoke specifically about the power of taking our shoes off and actually going and standing in some soil mm. and how that actually affects our physical body. Can you talk about that? Because I was watching going, that is amazing. And and it's so true. Even now I've got my sneakers on here with mm. a big plastic chunk between <laughs> me and the earth, but it's actually really good for us, right? Oh, it is so good. Yeah. So 10 years ago, I used to speak about um, how we disconnected ourselves from the sun. Mm. You know, we now know modern medicine is showing us that our disconnection from sunlight, both in the early morning, what they call sun gazing or indirect sunlight through the eyes, so powerful for our mood and antidepressant and energy levels and even the, the sleep-wake cycle, insomnia at night. But now we're finding we're disconnected ourselves from one of the most powerful sources of antioxidants and anti-inflammation on the planet, and it's the planet itself. So yes, in our modern wisdom, we sleep in elevated beds, we work in high-rise buildings, and even when we walk on the ground, we wear the best insulators known to man and womankind, plastic, plastic. and rubber soled mm. shoes. And so many of us are almost permanently disconnected from Mother Earth. And so a guy called Clint Ober, many years ago, he was um, sitting with a um, tribe of Native Americans. He was there for a couple of years, actually, and he was not on purpose. He wrote a book about how he had lost his purpose in life. And he used to be a TV cable man, a TV repair man. And so he started to notice that in this um, traditional culture, they would eat their meals on the ground, they would sleep on the ground, and then he was sitting on a park bench one day and he noticed they were all walking past barefoot. And he made the connection to maybe the fact that they're always connected to the ground is some way connected why they have, in those cultures, 90% less of chronic inflammatory diseases that we have in the West. And so he created, with his knowledge of TVs and TV cables that you had to always have a grounding or an earth wire to make it safe. He made these little makeshift beds with a grounding rod that grounds it, earths it, and he experimented and he had found people that started to sleep better. People that having insomnia and problems sleeping for years would sleep better. Pain would go away from their bodies. And so the last about four or five years of clinical research shows that when we ground ourselves more, we just go and have lunch in a park, we take the shoes and socks off and walk on the wet sand down at Bondi rather than the asphalt escarpment. We actually considerably improve all the blood profiles in the body, reduced pain, significant improvements in the 
quality and quantity of sleep and a whole host of other other benefits. Again, Mother Nature is the best healer on the planet. Mm. Cost us any money? No. Nothing. Free, cheap, easy, just beautiful. And just in looking at the idea that if if we're seeking to connect with our purpose, often that will drop in as like an idea or, or a vision and it's up there in the ether or in, uh, you know, within our mind's eye that To really manifest that, to really bring our purpose into the real world, we actually need to ground Mm. that energy. Mm. So, you know, taking your shoes off and and going and connecting with the earth and setting that intention around how you bring your purpose into the real world, Mm. um, I feel would be quite a powerful way to to make that dream real. Absolutely. And Mm. it's it's connecting a couple of things we've touched on earlier. One is you know, the future of health you spoke about. Mm. One of the big trends now coming out from what they call the Global Wellness Summit is that um, wellness retreats. And so tourism over the next five or 10 years is going to be very much based around on these wellness retreats that we don't just go to Las Vegas and get our system even more out of whack. But being in nature, as you're touching on, actually having this idea of space, you know, I mentioned getting away from work, getting away from life, having that space. But if we can do it also in a natural environment, that will definitely help around the clarity of that purpose and what is our purpose. Because nature, that's what nature is. You know, Mm. nature's not these different things. It's not nature out in the bush and nature in the ocean and nature God up there. Nature is one. Nature is whole. And so we talk about purpose is what nature wants us to do with our lives, whatever the creator is we call him or her or it, it's just one underlying intelligence to life. So the more we can connect with that and being out in the bush or the forest or camping is a beautiful way to to help that connection. So uh, hear her message much more clearly. Yeah, nice. And what a beautiful way to end the podcast. Thank you so much for joining me today on Decoding Purpose. Mark Bunn. Thank you, Beck, and keep doing your wonderful work in uh, inspiring others in purpose because there's nothing, nothing better we can do in life. So, Thank you. It's been such a pleasure to have you here today. Beautiful. I'm excited to announce a partnership that I am personally so passionate about, and that partnership is with Ambezi. Ambezi are a brand new tech platform, and they are connecting entrepreneurs and business people who have amazing stories to share with the next generation. So the way Ambezi works is it connects entrepreneurs with local schools and local universities, and the intention is to inspire, educate, and activate purpose and passion for the next generation. All you need to do to give one hour is log on to www.ambezi.com.